my tenants are paying for the asset, but I still get rights to depreciate the entire 800,000. And if I could accelerate that as much as possible, in some cases, especially with cost segregation, that initial deduction actually exceeds my initial investment. Hello, and thank you for joining us today on the Gentle Art of Crushing It show, where we focus on learning and sharing with our listeners all there is to know about how to create success in our lives. This show stands on the shoulders of giants, Our mission is to empower and inspire our listeners to create the life of their dreams whilst having a blast in the process. Let's celebrate life together. Welcome to the show. All right. Welcome back to the Gentle Art of Crushing It podcast, Passive Investing Edition. My name's Randy Smith. I'm your host today. And I'm really excited to have a a friend of mine, Justin Jensen, on with us today. He is my personal CPA and CPA of the stars here in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, he is a tax partner with Morrison Clark and Company and just a fantastic all around guy. So, Justin, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Randy. Thanks for having me. That was so nice to say. And it, feelings mutual. You're a friend. I, I'm, I'm happy to be involved with your real estate and see you succeed and shoot the moon. So, let's do it. Outstanding. Well, why don't we go ahead and jump right in? Justin, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and um, yeah, how you found your your space or working with real estate investors uh, as a CPA? Yeah, absolutely. And, and appreciate you asking because it's it's it goes clear back to when I was in college. I was doing a, an internship while I was in graduate school. I did an internship for a real estate investment company that does syndications and they had commercial property, residential property, hotels and restaurants, I mean, all kinds of things. Um, So I got involved with that and all I did was prepare tax returns. But after one year of that, my first job was with PricewaterhouseCoopers in Seattle. And when I got there, the partners there were like, hey, you did did real estate in college. Why don't you just do real estate here with us? And so it just kind of continued to snowball. But after four years of doing, about segregation and real estate investments and developments and, and working in that space at a very high level, um, the firm that I d- had done an internship with called me back and said, we want you back as our tax director, oversee all of our tax preparation. So I did that for three years. And that was that was where I really got my feet wet in real estate because I sold, no, I turned my home in Port Orchard, Washington into my first rental property. I relocated to Utah. Um, where then I, as part of the executive team, I got to be involved with acquisitions of properties and got to do, um, got to take my fair share of the the acquisition fees and commissions. And usually in lieu of that, I would take equity in whatever property we were investing in. So that that always turned out really nice. Uh, Got me into real estate. I'm still investing with that same company even now, 15 plus years later. Um, But after three years there, I decided that I really missed Public accounting, and it was interesting because the the investor group there said, with all of the P ones that I was preparing coming out of that company, that it, and in mo- in a lot of cases it was three quarters or more of their personal tax returns. So I was getting approached, and they were saying, "Why don't you just do the rest of my tax return?" And uh, I said, "Yeah, I'll do it." And so I took on like this this core group of real estate investors as my as my critical mass base of clients. So right out of the gate, when I went out on my own as a CPA. I was still in real estate. All my clients were doing real estate. I still invested in real estate. Um, after three years of that, this was, I was still living in Utah. I just I wasn't gaining enough traction. Um, I was looking for something more. I ran across an ad on LinkedIn that was looking for um, a CPA with big four experience, real estate background, and an entrepreneurial mindset. I said, oh, that sounds pretty good. I called on that and, and uh, got hired on the spot. That was Tom Wilwright's firm, ProVision. And that was in 2011. So I relocated to, um, well, I live in Mesa, Arizona, but I relocated to Arizona. I've been here ever since. Um, and after five years with ProVision and um, now being with this firm for five years, I just continue to specialize in real estate. It just seems to be what I do. I love it. I love investing in it. I love seeing my clients be successful with it. I love helping them plan. I love helping them the strategy. You know, paying zero tax is is awesome, and there's a lot of opportunity with that in real estate. So, it just seems to be what I do, and just have a have a knack for it, or definitely a passion for it. I I love it, and you mentioned a little a, a little name, Tom Wheelwright. For those that may or may not know who Tom Wheelwright is, can you share with the audience who who he is and who he's affiliated with? 
Well, he's my mentor, most of all. So, <laughs> okay, no, he's, he's affiliated with you. Yes, <laughs> he's the uh, he's the uh, CPA, the tax advisor to Robert Kiyosaki, a rich dad, poor dad. And so, you know, it was it was neat when I worked for him. Uh, in the last year that I worked for him, I I had the opportunity to travel with him, also with also with Garrett Sutton, who is the legal advisor to the one of the rich dad education advisors. Um, and I got to assist them in teaching tax and asset protection classes to all the rich dad students. Um, kind of as a result of that, I'm still very affiliated with with Garrett Sutton, with with other rich dad advisors. I have a lot of rich, uh, rich dad education clients that 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 do this kind of stuff, and so we speak the same language, and and we like being involved with that with each other. I love it. Well, so you definitely qualify as an expert uh, as a CPA and all things real estate related, as far as I'm concerned. And actually, most of uh, most of my network here in the Valley um, either does business with you or knows of you and respects you really well. So, yeah, thank you so much for being on the show and, and kind of sharing, sharing your knowledge. So that's flattering. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's it's cool. Like, I feel like I've got this one on one relationship with you. And yet so many people I talk to. Um, know you as well, like you and trust you as well. So it's just, it's neat to be um, into that. And I was actually referred to you by one of our mutual partners as well, who is now a partner of mine uh, in Impact Equity. So yeah, the, the community is small and strong for sure. Yeah, really a big, small world out there. A small, big world. <laughs> this is Chad Ackerman, founder of Left Field Investors. And I'm inviting you to listen to our podcast, The LFI Spotlight. Tired of the Wall Street roller coaster? Discover how to invest in real assets as I interview syndicators, seasoned passive investors, and other experts every week. We'll help you learn about cash flowing syndications, bringing you closer to financial freedom. Visit leftfieldinvestors.com to listen to the podcast, subscribe to our newsletter, and connect with like-minded passive investors. Join us today. Well, let's let's kind of jump into some stuff. Like you, you mentioned, um, real estate is just one of the very best ways to um, create tax advantage situations and help to even even the W-2 employee, it can be very advantageous to help their tax situation as well. So um, maybe at a high level, we you know, we've had cost segregation specialists on here, but can you talk a little bit about cost segregation, bonus depreciation, like how that factors in to this whole place from a CPA perspective? Oh, absolutely. From from my perspective, it's like my favorite thing in the world. Um, one of the concepts that I learned from from not only Tom Wheelwright when I was working for him, but from my employer pre or prior to him um, when I was with the real estate investment firm, um, they both have the same sentiment towards depreciation. It works like magic, especially if you use leverage. Because if I buy, and I always use the million dollar example, if I buy a million dollar property and I allocate 80% of that purchase price to a building, um, uh, then I have an $800,000 depreciable asset. But I'm not paying a million dollars out of pocket for that asset. I'm only coming down with a down payment. You know? And I know it's we were talking earlier, it's not necessarily 80% loan to value anymore, but it makes it for easy math. We understand the principles here. So if I'm only coming up with 20% down, I, my two hundred thousand dollar investment buys me an eight hundred thousand dollar depreciable asset. Now my my tenants are paying for the asset, but I still get rights to depreciate the entire eight hundred thousand. And if I can accelerate that as much as possible, in, in some cases, especially with cost segregation, that initial deduction actually exceeds my initial investment, and uh, and I've sheltered all that income. But it's just magic. Yeah, it, it's uh, it. It is the one thing when I finally figured out what this was, like the light came on and it was like this aha moment, like, oh my gosh, like this is how they're doing it. You know, people that are making, you know, millions of dollars a year and not paying federal taxes, this is the thing that allows that to occur. Yeah. Very good. So um, now the cost segregation process, um, as I mentioned, we, we've gotten into that, but essentially it's just a way where you can experience that depreciation sooner, um, which really just escalates the the value of depreciation in tax benefits overall. So very, very cool. Now, um, one other thing that comes into place, and this is something that is kind of that, that unicorn that I think a lot of real estate investors 
are searching for. And this idea of real estate professional or reps, you'll hear it referenced as, um, can you give us kind of a high level of what that is and how that might apply to somebody? You know, you, you look at taxpayers and, you know, obviously all my clients are taxpayers, but the, the IRS wants to say that all taxpayers are created equal and borrowing from Orwell, I would say, but some are more equal than others. And if you're a real estate professional, you're definitely more equal than others. You know, you've got some advantages available to you that, that not everybody has. So, um, you know, and the requirements for real estate, I don't know if you want to discuss that quickly, the 750 hour rule. The, the interesting thing about that is I attend other um, um, other presentations and, and seminars sometimes, um, meetups. And it's unfortunate that sometimes what I hear is that that the presenters will say, uh, all you got to do is have 750 hours in real estate and you're golden. I say, well, it's not that simple because the IRS has listed specifically what qualifies as real estate professional hours and education is not on that list. So it, 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 it takes a concerted effort sometimes and it's something that, that I'd like to make sure that we plan with our clients to make sure that we're going to, if, if the goal is to hit real estate professional, we're going to make sure that we hit it. The news come out, you know, that the IRS wants to hire 87,000 more agents and, and they're having the same troubles that the rest of us are. We can't find people, you know, to, and they can't find people either. Um, but if, if, if any one of our clients are going to get audited, we want them to just feel confident and comfortable that we're not doing anything that's not provided for in the law. We follow the rules. Here's how it works. And we'd, we'd have nothing to fear under audit. So bring it on. Um, not that I would ever welcome them, but uh, sure. you, you sure. get the point. Yeah. Um, um, so having said that, you know, the, the qualified real estate professional allows you to take these losses in in real estate, which are passive. Passive losses can only be used to offset passive income. Um, and so because of that, unless we qualify as real estate professional or meet some other exceptions based on income, um, then we wouldn't be able to take our real estate losses and offset our W-2 income. We have to qualify for real estate professional in order to do that. And uh, you know, there's things that we need to do to make sure that we do qualify. 750 hour rule, job you spend more time in real estate than in any other activity. Um, but the only hours that count are the hours of the properties that you own um, or that you, know, that you have, a, have an interest in, that you own more than 5% of a business, or that you have material participation in, and, and that can be a high hurdle for some, you know. So it, it, it's not as easy as just saying, well, our 750 hours has to be very specific hours, and, and they have to be hours that you, where you materially participate. It makes it hard for a limited partner uh, investor, and I say that because I'm I'm an LP in every investment that I make. Um, I'll never qualify as real estate professional. I still benefit from it. We'll talk about that. But um, as an LP you're really not spending any time on that. So you can't count that as, you know, as any of your real estate professional hours. Um, should, you know, there's, there's things that we can do to combat that, which I don't know if we have time to get into. There's college courses on all this kind of stuff. So we could get into a whole lot of depth. But, uh, you know, the point being that if, if we plan carefully and, and work closely with our clients, we can make sure that they qualify for real estate professional. I love it. Yeah. And I, I think the important thing there, and I, I've, I've heard this over and over again, is be sure to partner with your CPA, somebody who's very skilled, understand the laws and can guide you through that process. And I know you and I worked very, very closely last year. Um, you told me step by step, this is what we need to be doing, what qualifies, what doesn't qualify. Um, but if you are able to hit that rep status, it can have a, a very, very significant impact on your on your tax world. Um, but and and I think you know we didn't start the the podcast off by saying this, but um, I'm not a CPA. Justin is a CPA, but he is not providing tax advice here because unfortunately you need to be a client with Justin in order to get actual actual get uh, that advice from him. But that that is important to note as well. Appreciate you saying that, and so does my insurance company. They remind me of that all the time. So thank you. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah. What are some things that the new or newer passive investors should know uh, about taxes, about um, this whole world of depreciation, um, other different aspects or benefits of real estate investing that, that they can take advantage of? Oh, I think that's a great question. And I think it's important because um, a lot of times 
someone gets real excited about real estate, well, they're working full time in their job. And they're saying, well, they're seeing all their friends or other people are doing really well with their real estate investments. Um, and then here we've talked about real estate professional. Well, if I'm working full time, I'm working 2000 plus hours for a W-2 income, then it's not likely that I'm going to be able to qualify as a real estate professional. You, know, you have to meet that, that 750 hour rule um, and more time in real estate than in, than in any other activity. Well, if I'm working 2,000 hours for a W-2, I'd have to work more than 2,000 hours in real estate. And there's been court case after court case where someone tried and the IRS said, no, there's no way. You have to live. You you can't just be working full time here and then do a real estate 750 hours or more. <laughs> right. um, so well, I think that one of the important things that, that especially limited partners need to realize is that we you invest in real estate and we take advantage of cost segregation and we accelerate that depreciation. And that's definitely one of the enticing things about getting into real estate are the tax benefits. Um, when you see other investors in the same, in the same investment are getting real estate professional and they're able to take the big deduction of cost segregation and you're not able to, as a limited partner, that kind of think it's kind of stinks a little bit. You think, well, gosh, I, I thought I was getting all these benefits and you don't get them. Um, but but what, what limited partners need to realize is that here again, that passive loss only offsets other sources of passive income. Well, if you're in one investment, then yeah, then that passive loss that you couldn't deduct in year one gets to roll forward and it'll roll forward indefinitely. It just continues to roll forward until you either do generate passive income, even from an other investment um, or the property sells, and then at that point, all of the passive losses that were suspended would be freed up immediately. So any gain that you recognize on the sale of that property would be offset by the sale or by the uh, suspended loss in that same property. Um, but it, you know, as you get on this hamster wheel where you make an investment in the real in in one activity, they do a cost segregation. You can't take those losses if you're if you're a limited partner. You're not a real estate professional. Um, well, if you make another investment or in the next year you make another investment, you know, this first one that you invested in that took cost segregation, they front loaded all that depreciation, um, which means that later on, if you hold it for three or five years or more, depending on what the strategy is, you're going to get to the point where those K1s are no longer showing losses, they're showing income. So now I have passive income. And if I have another real estate investment that's taking those losses like we just talked about, the losses in the first investment would offset the income from the second, you know, the, the loss from the second investment would offset the income from the first investment. And now, now I've got tax-free income. So it still works even for a limited partner. And uh, I get real excited about that. And we can strategize around that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of that beauty. Like I talk a lot of times, like we're placing these, you know, 25, 50, hundred thousand dollar investments, like, trying to do that almost on a, um, you know, is whatever regular interval that you can do those on. And once you hit that beautiful spot where things start to go full cycle, it starts created. Um, I always say tax advantaged income. I've, I don't, I've been around banking long enough to know that I can't ever say tax free, but um, tax advantaged. And you're the, you're the guy though, if we can say it, then we'll say it. Um, but it creates this beautiful, freedom where you're creating income that you're not having to give a very large portion to the IRS. And that really starts to create some freedom um, and some security and some independence from, or like I say, uh, decreasing your dependence on your W-2. And as those start to go full cycle and start to sack up, it starts to get really, really exciting. So oh, totally does. And, and let me just say this, because I know that I, I have conversations a lot where people will say, well, gosh, if you're not paying taxes, then you're not entitled to things that taxes pay for. And I say, well, give me a break because the tax code is written specifically to incentivize you to make these investments for that reason. You're not, you're not doing any, there's no loopholes here. We're not talking about loopholes. Because understand that uh, loopholes are tax laws that have an unintended consequence. But what we're talking about is very intentional. The laws were written specifically to do this, to incentivize you to in make these investments. Government's not in the business of providing housing or providing jobs or pumping cash flow into the economy. But they know if they incentivize you to do it, that you'll do it. You know, And then and it'll be done at a much higher scale and much more effectively by people who are in the business of doing these things and they know what they're doing. So I, 
you know, to, to shelter the income so that there's no taxes to pay. I, I think that's as American and patriotic as, you know, I hear others say, well, taxes are just a cost of doing business. Well, that's an unfortunate outlook because uh, um, that's not what the government even intended. They want you to make these other investments. That's why these codes are, these tax codes are written to, to incentivize you to do that. Yeah, it, it's funny you say that because I and, and it is something that's talked constantly that these tax plans are put in place to drive behavior. And I I come from a sales background where commission structures are built to drive behaviors. Um, and if leadership wants to drive a certain behavior, they create a comp plan that's going to drive that behavior. It's the exact same thing in the tax code that, um, you know, if we were if the government were to get into affordable housing um, like as their business model, we would see them do it very ineffectively um, and not produce a good result. But it, these tax codes drive the entrepreneurs to go out there and to create ultimately what the government wants. So, um, and, and it is somewhat of a mindset shift where you've got to get to the point where you see that. And as an entrepreneur, start looking like, where is the tax code telling me that I should spend my time and energy? Um, and then align that with your expertise and ultimately that allows everybody, everybody to benefit from it. So I love that. Now, now we, we talk about um, passive losses offsetting passive income because of depreciation. There is something called depreciation recapture as well. So that kind of scares people. Can you talk about what that looks like, how it impacts the overall return and impact of the, the tax implications? Oh, I'm happy to, because that's definitely a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, I, I do hear prospective clients, even hear other CPAs say, well, I don't know why you're going to take that depreciation. You just got to pay it all back in the end anyway. And that just right off the bat tells me you clearly do not understand depreciation and capture. It does not work that way. Um, I think the best way to look at it, just to simplify it, and here again, I mean, there's College level courses in in this you know level of accounting and taxation, but uh, the easiest way to look at it would be if I bought a, a um, property for a million dollars, have depreciable assets of a million dollars, and I depreciated two hundred thousand dollars. Now my remaining depreciable basis in that property is eight hundred thousand. If I sell it for one point two million, um, that's a four hundred thousand dollar gain because my basis is now eight hundred thousand. All that means is the first so rather than 400,000 at the capital gains rates at 20% or, or 15 or 20%, um, it means that, that that depreciation that I took of 200,000 gets taxed at a higher rate. The IRS says, hey, when you took the deduction for depreciation, you took that at whatever your, um, whatever your tax rate is. Say it's 37%, just for an easy example. So you got a 37% deduction when you took depreciation. But then, so then they say, so when you sell it at a gain, we're not going to let you tax it at 20%. There's, that's, they're like, no deal. We're going to have to find some way to recapture some of that. And the maximum rate of depreciation recapture is 25%. So what that means is if I'm in the 37% tax bracket and I deduct it at 37%, if later on I sell it and gets recaptured at uh, 25%, and that's only on the gain that's attributable to the depreciation that I deducted, if it's capped at 25%, that 12% depreciation is mine forever. It's never recaptured. And I, you know, I get to keep that. Um, and if my tax rate is only 20%, then I'm not recaptured at 25%. It's my whatever my tax rate is up to 25%. So, um, you know, it's it's not a bad deal. Uh, it, you'd, you'd, and you'd be crazy to not depreciate because of for fear of depreciation or capture in the end. I guess what I'm getting at is people say recapture, and that's a little bit of a misnomer because it's, it doesn't mean that all of the depreciation that you deducted gets added back to the end. It doesn't. It's just taxed at a different rate. It's, it's really all that it means. Yeah, and really the difference between the two is the benefit that it brings to you, right? And a and dollar in your pocket today is more powerful than a dollar in the future, right? Consider the time value of money and what you can do with that dollar in the meantime. I would do that every day. Do it all day. I love it. I love it. All right. So I wanted to get into something that might be a little controversial, but personally, I spent 25 years in corporate America and I accumulated 401ks. And yes, I, I leverage self-directed accounts and all of those types of things, which there's plenty of shows that we've talked about the benefits of doing that. But I'm of the mindset that 
my dollars would be better used to invest outside of the tax protection of a self-directed IRA because it would give me the ability to create um, what I call livable income, money that I can actually live on, not just money that's going back into my self-directed account to be touched when I'm getting old and grayer, right? So does it make sense or can it make sense for somebody to cash out their old 401k or their IRA, pay the taxes and the penalty to put those dollars to work in real estate? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. That is a conversation that I have on a regular basis. Um, I receive a referral from somebody and they say, hey, we want to get we want to start investing in real estate. And we understand that you do a lot in real estate. Um, you know, and if I ask them, well, what is your motive in investing in real estate? Well, high rates of return plus the tax benefits. And then I have to explain to them, well, if you're going to do that in your Roth IRA or any other retirement account, those tax benefits are wasted on you. Um, and, and I don't mean to sound completely um, against it because there are there are those that would say, Justin, I get what you're saying, but the rates of return I can get in real estate through my retirement account are much better than I can get in an index fund or in the stock market. So I would still rather do that. And I say, if that's if that's the case, then fine. But if you tell me that you're doing it for tax benefits, then this is the conversation that I have a lot with prospective clients, especially where, where we would say, all right, you've got a million dollars in your retirement account. You want to take some of that out and invest with it. What's going to be the tax hit? What do you need to invest in to cover the uh, the income that you're going to have to reg recognize taxes on from that withdrawal? Um, and then if you're, if you're not over 59 and a half, there's going to be a 10% early withdrawal penalty. There's a lot of moving parts that we'll put pen to paper and say, okay, even if you have to pay that freight on the front end and you pay some taxes, if you hold that investment three to five years, um, a lot of times in most cases, you're gonna come out ahead in that same three to five year time span. And that's where we run the numbers. And I'll meet with clients and say, we'll see if that makes sense for you. The one thing I always say though, is do not take it out until you know where you're gonna put it. You know, Don't just pull it out and sit on it and then find something, you'll run out of time. Timing is a, timing is paramount because if I withdraw that, if I were to see we're we're in mid year now, you know June July. If I withdraw that money now, um, I'm probably still okay. But if I withdraw it in November or December, and I don't invest it before the end of the year, then by April of the next year, I'm paying taxes on that, you know. But if I withdraw it in January or February of next year, I'm yeah, that when you withdraw it, you're going to have some withholdings. Most of the administrators will withhold 10 or 20 percent just because they know there'll be taxes due on it. Um, but I don't have to absolutely pay those taxes until April of the next year. So that gives me 15 months or so of use of that cash before the taxes are due. If I can find an investment that will do this cost segregation and we can meet all the requirements to take the full deduction, then I can offset the, the tax hit on that withdrawal. Other than that, that early withdrawal penalty, we can't get out of that. That's etched in stone. But we can take the edges off of it, and you can the break-even point is is a very short period of time, you know. And in the worst-case scenario, I, what I've seen is a three to five-year break-even point. But in, in either case, long-term wise, I've I've never seen one come out with them when, when we've run the numbers where you don't come out ahead in that period of time. So that being said, and not to sound biased, even though I am. I, I just don't I don't like the idea of re investing in real estate in my retirement account. It doesn't make sense to me. Okay. So does when you withdraw the money from um if you were to pull money out of an old 401k or an IRA is that treated as active income? Yes. It is. Okay. So j once again the um passive losses can't count against your active income of withdrawing from a 401k or an IRA um unless you have real estate professional status. Correct. So, and, and this could be a whole other tangent, and then I know we don't have all the time in the world, but um, <clears throat> for my for my employed clients that, that have these big accounts and they want to get out and they want to do something else other than index funds or, real estate or a, a stock market in their retirement accounts, um, a lot of times we're going to start looking at short-term rentals. You know, as long as the average stay is less than seven days, then, then we can still do a cost segregation on those same properties and it's not passive, it's active. So now that active loss can offset the withdrawal from the retirement account and I've offset the taxes. So point being, there's a lot of opportunity to strategize, to take 
to minimize the tax implications. Um, but it, it takes some concerted effort and, and some planning, you know, with a tax professional that understands that stuff. So, And probably very important, don't call Justin on December 15th and say, hey, I've got some big plans for this year with my tax strategy, right? Too late. Too late. Yeah. Talk regularly, frequently, and often um, and early throughout the year with your CPA. We uh, Something I learned from Tom Wheelwright, and I'll give him credit where credit is due. Um, the saying goes, if you want to change your tax, you've got to change your facts. So if you call in November or December, we've only got five or six weeks to change the facts. And that's not a whole lot of time. The earlier in the year, the better. And the more often, the better, so that we have all the time in the world to change those facts. The worst case scenario is those clients that come in in March and April and say, here's what I did last year. Now get me out of paying taxes. Like, well, we can't wave a magic wand and now we can't change the facts. So, you know, got to do it proactively. I love it. I love it. Well, that's that's a good way to finish. What what I'm realizing right now is that this should not just be a once a year episode with Justin either. So we we should probably do this more often. Um, there's so much more that uh, that I know that you could share with us because I've learned so much from you just in the little time that you and I've been working together over the last couple of years. But um, been really fun having you on the show. I do have a handful of questions I'd like to ask every guest on the show. So if you don't mind, we'll just jump right into those. Okay. Knock yourself out. Perfect. All right. So as a passive investor yourself, um, and since our audience is newer, newer passive investors, what would be some good educational resources you would direct somebody to that was just starting on this path? Um, and passive investing wise. Oh, that's interesting. So I'm in the middle of reading a book, and I don't want to sound biased, but I am in the middle of reading a book. It was written by my old boss. It's called Win-Win Wealth Strategy. Uh, there's a lot of really good information in this that, that even as a passive investor, you can realize, uh, you know, find the best ways to, to, uh, to um, you know, affect your tax situation in, in a positive way. Um, but the, to simplify that, and even in, in the same vein of pointing out that book specifically, there's so much information out there. Just educate yourself. But don't educate yourself to where you, you realize that analysis paralysis. You know, educate yourself, talk to people who are doing what you want to do, and, and just, you know, don't hold back. Just arm yourself with information. An educated investor is a good investor. I love it. I love it. Um... What is uh, what? What would be the easiest way for our audience to get a hold of you or see what else you're doing out there, Justin? Oh, great, great, great question. Um, if I can be found on LinkedIn, um, Justin S. Jensen or LinkedIn slash Justin S. Jensen. Um, also, our our firm website at MorrisonClarkCompany.com. dot com. Um, great way. Plus, there you can contact me either on LinkedIn or on the website, and you know we can get the ball rolling that way. Um, but listen, I will say this because we, we we've experienced such growth in the last couple of years that uh, um, we want to be able to take care of the clients that we have, and we want to be able to take care of any new clients that we bring on. So we are in the process of hiring more team members. Um, but even at that, if you just say, "Well, look, Justin, I've already got a good tax person. I just want to ask you some questions." I always say I'm happy to go to lunch with anybody anytime, <laughs> and we can just have a nice conversation and get to know each other and. And, uh, you know, keep tabs on each other. So, but I'm seriously, I love talking about this and would do it all day, every day. So if anybody wants to meet, I'm happy to meet anytime. I love it. I love it. Very good. Um, and, and one final question, which is just kind of a fun one. Do you have a recent bucket list item you've checked off your list or one that you're hoping to in the near future? That's a great question. It's, it's interesting. About a year ago, I bought my 16-year-old son in 1998. BMW 323i. And, it had, and the reason I bought it, one, because the price was right, but, but also it's a manual transmission. And uh, the one thing I, I wanted, I have three sons and I wanted all my sons to know how to drive a manual transmission. Um, but the long story short is this. I've ridden motorcycles my whole life. In fact, you can see the little motorcycle behind me. Um, and I've always had bikes. And so my kids have always been around bikes. My 21-year-old son you know, in the last year, he, he's been asking me his whole life, Dad, will you teach me how to ride? And I've always kind of punted and said, well, first you need to learn how to drive a manual transmission, and then I'll teach you how to ride. So a year ago, I bought his car, and he learned how to drive a stick, 
And so then a few months ago, well, last year, he said, okay, dad, I drive stick. Now you can teach me how to ride a bike. So I had to make good on that. And uh, I signed him up for the Harley Davidson class, the rider safety course. And uh, he passed it with flying colors. And the two of us now go on bikes and do on go on rides together. And I have just loved that. You know, it's like this new renewed connection with my with one of my sons that uh, that's something that he and I can do together. And I absolutely love it. I love it. Th- I love it. Thank you for sharing. That is, uh, you know, um, memories with children or memory memories with family members are just the, the greatest thing in the world. And they pay they pay dividends for years and years and years to come. So that's beautiful. Yeah. Well, Justin, thank you so much. It's been so fun having you on here. We've been trying to do this for a handful of months. I'm so glad we finally made it happen. Uh, But thank you so much for all the value you brought to the audience. Thank you. Anytime, anytime. And I look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you, Randy. Awesome. All right. To our audience, as always, we uh, always want to encourage you to continue your education process in passive investing. More important than that, though, we encourage you to make the decision to invest in your first deal. Find a great operator that you know, like, and trust. Invest in that first deal. And we'll be convinced or we're convinced that you'll be so happy you did. You wish you would have started earlier. So um, continue to decrease your dependence on your W-2 through this space. And join us again next Thursday for another great episode. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, another episode of The Gentle Art of Crushing It. It was an amazing episode. We know we sure learned a lot, and we hope you did as well. We want to take a second and thank you so much for viewing or listening to this episode. And please just know that we only ask for one favor, and that is to make this life magnificent. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.